seated. Amen. Thank you, David and team. Thank you so much for those good songs today. Uh, and uh, it's one of those things today, what I'm trusting in, despite all the difficulties and the challenges and the brokenness in the world around us, is uh, it's his faithfulness that's the anchor of the day, uh, not the ability of uh, human leaders to organize themselves or to move us forward or figure out who they are or who we are. So uh, thank God that uh, he's on the throne today, and I have reason to have confidence that things are moving toward the goal for which he's made in them. And so I'm excited about that today. Well, I want to encourage you. I want you to open your, your Bibles, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 5. And uh, it's going to sound like we planned this, but we, we did plan it, but not in the way that it seems like. Uh, it is uh, Valentine's Day, uh, right, April 14th. It's not an official church holiday, in case, in case you want to know about that. Uh, we're not recognizing it because of that, but we're just recognizing in culture that it, it is a day uh, where uh, there are a lot of uh, bouquets being bought and, and uh, flowers exchanged and, and men regretting that they forgot it, uh, you know, and all those kind of things like that that happen uh, today on Valentine's Day. Uh, sometimes dreams realized and sometimes dreams unrealized are all happening right on the day of uh, uh, February the 14th. Well, so it seems like we probably scheduled this that we're going to talk about God's wisdom on sexual intimacy on, on uh, February 14th, but that was not a part of our thinking. Uh, it was one of the topics that we wanted to address from Proverbs uh, because it's perennially important for us to address as a church, uh, and it's something that our culture has lost its mind on, uh, and we need to fo follow God's wisdom in the face of the world in which we live. So we're in a series on the book of Proverbs, and what we're trying to do here is we're trying to look for God's guidance for life, right? And as Will uh, mentioned here in his own testimony, we're looking for God's guidance for life because uh, we live in the wild, and we've used that to uh, depict what the Bible talks about as we stepped away from God initially, and Adam and Eve did. We stepped out from under the umbrella of his care. We felt we could make it on our own, and we brought chaos on top of ourselves in our own lives and the lives of each other. Uh, and the world itself is impacted because of our sin. And so we live life in the wild, and the only hope that we have for life in the wild is Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus is God's answer to a bunch of rebels who walked off as idiots from him. Uh, the biblical term for people who walk off and say that there is no God is the term fool. And so people who willingly became fools and walked away from the God who made them felt that they could figure out life on their own uh, and that they could recast life and make it different uh, just by thinking about it, uh, just by their own will, uh, even though God had built into creation his design, even though he had designed them to function in a particular relationship with him, even though he meant for them to live in particular relationships with each other, they said, no, 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 we can figure that out on our own. We don't need God to tell us what's good and what's evil. We can be our own standards of good and evil. So what we created is uh, uh, all kinds of brokenness, all kinds of sin and pain, all kinds of distortions and perversions of the good things that God has given us. And so this life in the wild is only hopeful to get out from underneath the, the power of the wild is to have Jesus reclaim us, to redeem us. We talked about that when we were talking about communion last time, that he's the one who buys our freedom, who brings us into an intimate relationship with God, the God we had spurned, and helps us return back to the Father that we left so that we can understand really who we are and what life is about. And so here, we're turning to the book of Proverbs, one of the wisdom scriptures in the Old Testament that get God's wisdom on how to live this new life out. And so we found, as we've looked at this new life, that the beginning and end of the wise life, it gets started and it also culminates, two things, the beginning and end of the wise life is a fear of God, right? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom right? And it's also the end of wisdom. It's where wisdom takes you. And so we tried to define that, right, as someone who has a fear of God. It's not someone who walks around thinking that God's like the Zeus of old, right, who's got the power of lightning, uh, but he's fallen and broken and full of lust and envy and power hungry and so forth and so on. And so you have to give sacrifices to Zeus so that he doesn't just send a bolt down to you, right, when you're not paying attention, or you can miss it, or you can coerce him to not do it. No, God is not that kind of God. This is a God who has created everything. This is the God who presently sustains everything that exists. The reason why we live and move, as Paul would say in Acts 17, and have our very existence is because God sustains it. 
And he's also the God who came into the world that we had broken in Jesus Christ to take into himself the consequences of our rebellion, to take that on himself, to free us from its consequences, and to win back for us the life that we had lost. Right? So the God that we're talking to, we need a reverential awe of him. We need to revere him appropriately. And within scriptures, that means to have a fear of God means that you love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you trust him in such a way that you would be afraid to disobey him. You'd be afraid to disobey him. You, you, would, you would so recognize his goodness and greatness that you would say it's the height of foolishness to look at God and say, I know better. The creator God who made you is the God who knows how you should live. The creator God who sent his son to redeem you is the God who can bring you to life and guide you and take you home. So the issue here is the fear of God is the beginning in. So when you find someone by God's grace who is rescued from their rebellion, you find some who, a person who begins to revere God for who he is. And as you grow in your Christian life, you become more and more someone who trusts in God, believes in God, and recognizes, as we sang here, that really what I'm really trusting in today is the faithfulness of God and his promises. That is what undergirds the whole of my life, really, right, today. Because the promises of God, I don't care how difficult the day is, I don't care how bad your week was, if you have come to know Jesus Christ, right, if you've believed in him, if you've turned from your sin and said, God, I am a rebel, I was a fool, God, I thought I was so wise, but now I recognize I was running from you. God, would you deliver me? And I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he took what I needed to take. I believe that he provides life for me, and I trust in him completely. I don't look to anything else, right? If that's happened to you today, then you recognize the, the, the deliverance that you've received, and what you want to do is you want to pursue and know him, and I want more and more to be brought into conformity with his will, right? Because he's a good God. He's a great God. He's the creator God. And he's my only hope, right? And so today, uh, we want to look at God's wisdom. And again, the, the whole issue of the book of Proverbs is the key question of the book of Proverbs is, are you ready and willing to be taught? Are you ready and willing to be taught? Okay. So wisdom is personified. And also sometimes it comes out, the call of wisdom comes out through the voice of parents trying to teach their uh, young son. And so Proverbs 1, 8, 9, the, the cry of the book of Proverbs, listen, my son. Put it here in terms of the scriptures. Listen, people of God. Listen to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They will be a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. Right? The teaching of God, if you lean into his wisdom, it will adorn your life. It'll adorn your relationships. It'll redeem them and reclaim them. It'll give you wisdom on how to use your money, right? It'll help you from not wasting your life on things that don't matter. It'll take you out of the path of people who want to lead you down. And this is what Proverbs are. Take you out of the path of people who want to lead, lead you to right to the grave, right? Well, you don't want to follow them there. So, the wisdom of Proverbs. Now, You'll see in your notes here, and I hope you do have your notes. I want to encourage you. I'll try to fill in the blanks. Uh, well, Chris isn't here to remind me that I didn't fill in the blanks, so I have to look at Christine now. To tell me. Oh, I don't see him. I'm somewhere here this morning. I know he's here. Uh, but I have, I have certain uh, people that to have a blank and not fill it in is like one of the cardinal sins, right? Uh, and so I don't want to do that to you today. So if you notice I didn't fill one in, I can even point Barry Skelly. He can raise his hand and say, Greg, you forgot this one. Uh, and we'll get it filled in. But I want to make sure that you fill those in. And uh, this is not a sermon that I wanted to have visuals. Right? For so many reasons. Right? Don't need any more visuals. You got like a, a gazillion visuals every day. Right? You probably saw, I don't know how many, if you just got out on the web this morning. Some of the guys got out to check the sports. I mean, what am I going to watch later today? And hanging around that website were all kinds of invitations to all kinds of uh, things to go to in your mind. Uh, that you had to fight for today. Maybe you got out on the news. Maybe you heard the latest craziness that happened somewhere else. Right? You got on your Instagram feed and you were just a little, a little, you know, you saw the regular things that came through your Instagram feed and so you had a little bit of extra time so you put over on the little search thing down there. You punked that. I'm, I'm confessing. 
put that on the on the 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 little search thing, and then you get this little menu of all these little reels and TikToks, and you know TikToks are little short videos. You get all these little things, and then you just got on one of those feeds, and you start you know working your way through them. Start working your way through them, and then here comes so and so fitness trainer, right? Here comes so and so talking about the sex life of themselves and their partner. Here comes so-and-so, and you're working your way through, and you thought, ah, I didn't anticipate any of that this morning, right? So all the things that, that we come to, you don't need any visuals today. Matter of fact, most of us are struggling today because we have tons of visuals already burned into our brain. And they come to you in just the most unwelcome moments, right? So no visuals today, so you're just going to have to work with me here today. So here we come, and I, I'm going to try to take all of some tensions. I know they're rising in the room. I'm point them all out and help us to, to bring them to the fore so that they don't become background noises as we, as we listen to what God says. Now, in Proverbs, especially the Song of Songs, that's also called the Song of Solomon. How many of you have read the Song of Solomon, right? How many of you have actually understood the Song of Solomon? That's probably like half of us, right? Uh, and or, or number two, you read the Song of Solomon and you started blushing on your way through and said, maybe I don't need to understand it, right? Uh, so I don't know what it is, but the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon, here God directly and unflinchingly provides his wisdom on the topic of sexual intimacy, right? Directly and unflinchingly. However, this doesn't mean that it's an easy subject to talk about. I can testify to that. Today, it's hard to talk about something that is overhyped, right? In the culture in which we live, it's everything. On the one hand, and, some th- and something on the other hand that's distorted and made dirty, Even within the church, through the history of the church, sexual intimacy is a topic that has raised real tensions among God's people over when, where, and how to think and talk about it. On top of all that, right, on top of all those things, there are a lot of background noises in the lives of all of us gathered right here in this auditorium and online today, okay? Okay, so let me point out some of them, and some of them are pointed out right in the book of Proverbs, There are those among us who are young and naive. Yes, there are some people that are still left like that, right, that are young and naive. And the question we confront here is how do we talk about this subject in a way that is both true to the topic and appropriate for where they are, right? That's the challenge. You can decide today whether I hit it or not, okay? Two, there are people who are disoriented and addicted. How do we help them see the danger that they are in, and help them find freedom. How do we do that? Right? It's not about guilting people. How do we help them find freedom? Because there are people who are addicted to pornography. There are people who caught up in it. How, well, there's people among us who are the wounded and hurting. How do we keep from adding to their suffering unnecessarily as we talk about God's design? Or, on the other hand, there are the hardened and the angry. How do we grant the legitimacy of their desire for justice if they have been abused while still upholding the goodness of what for them is now synonymous with evil? How do we do that? Then, again, there are those who come to the topic of sexuality, especially within Christian circles, that sex, as according to Augustine in the history of the discussion, Sex is merely a necessary evil to have children. How do we encourage them not to dismiss or underestimate the importance of sexual intimacy in their marriages? And then finally, there are those that seem to have a healthy perspective on sexual intimacy, but how do we affirm them where we need to and yet encourage them to bring their vision in line with God's? So, Few things are on the table out here this morning. If I missed you, it <clears throat> wasn't intentional. It was just a, a group that didn't cross my mind, right? So obviously then we can't address everything that's in the room, okay? But here's what we're going to attempt to do today, right? So if you're, and this is all, you haven't filled in any blanks yet, right? Some of you are saying, are you going to get the blanks? I am. I'm going to get there, all right? But, but here, I just want to set the table here, and I want you to think about, okay? What we will do today is what we're going to do is we're going to lay out God's wisdom on sexual intimacy, and we're primarily going to draw from Proverbs 5. We're not going to draw from the whole of the biblical witness. You'll hear me bring in other aspects because there's a lot that Scripture has to say about it. 
But all the while, as we do that, we're going to ask God to teach us about what we need to learn. Okay, the key thing here is today is what do you need to learn today? What do we as a church need to learn? There's two things we're going to talk about, personal things that we need to think about and also corporate things that we need to think about, okay? So that's the first one. Also, I'm going to ask you to ask God to help us all together to affirm God's good plan for sexual intimacy so that we bring our thoughts and actions into conformity with his will, okay? One of the things is we want to come and our distorted vision of sexuality, either because of its abuse or either because we bought into the cultural ideas about it, right? That we want to come together and by faith, God, ask, help me, Lord, to recalibrate my thinking, to reorient my thinking so that I come to see sexual intimacy as you do and come to value it in the way that you do. Uh, and I want to honor you in my perspective. So what needs to be corrected, let me be corrected. What needs to be affirmed, let it be affirmed. What I don't know, God, teach me. So we want to do that and trust and underlying that, of course, do we really fear the God who is giving us instruction so that we trust him and are willing to bring our thoughts in line with his? And then lastly here, I'm encouraging us to ask him to protect us from the evil one as we talk about this topic, okay? And let me flesh out to you a little bit. This is my, my ode to screw tape letters here for a moment. Right? Screw tape letters was C.S. Lewis trying to talk about how the evil one works and he tried to personify it in a conversation between a son and a mom and different things like this. Well, what do we know that the evil one will be doing around a topic like this? Right? Um, one, I, ask, I want us to ask God to protect us from those of us who want to wallow in regret. As if God's grace is not strong enough to forgive us and turn ashes into something beautiful. Some of you, we bring up this topic and, and you immediately drop back into what you had done or what you have done and immediately you're, you're overwhelmed with regret and you think it's over and the evil one wants to put you in a hole and pound you in the hole and God says, no, my grace is deep enough to reclaim you and restore you and bring beauty. So I want to pray against that. And I want to, I want to, I want to ask, I want to pray against, right, the evil one wants to encourage us to give in to the world's counsel that your sexual drives control you and not you them. All right? The evil one wants to tell you that you, you, you have no control over them. They control you as if, right? Now think about this biblically, as if God created something to enslave you. As if he created something to enslave you and his power is not enough to free you so it's hopeless. Or maybe it's even cruel to ask you to restrain yourself to stay within God's boundaries. Right? The evil one wants to tell you right now that if you're addicted to something, if you're caught up in something that stands over against God's boundaries, that you're, you're, you're hopeless. You're, you can't get out of it. You can't break that power. Right? And matter of fact, it's cruel for somebody to call you away from it because that's something that you can't break. Right? That's what the evil one wants to say. Now he wants to say that to every man who's addicted to pornography. He wants to say that to everybody who's struggling with their sexual identity. He wants to say that to us and say that God really doesn't know. And I trust my own feelings more than I trust his wisdom. Okay? I want to I ask God to protect us against cynicism or sarcasm. As if to say that God is a liar in his po positive portrayal of sexual intimacy. Right? Now, here's one of the, I, I used this before. This is my favorite moments at Cedarville. I walked in one day. I, I, I mentioned this before. It was, it was Valentine's Day. And I was just feeling kind of goofy and giddy because it was Valentine's Day and there's stuff all over the place. And I walked up and it was in a theater at Cedarville. And I walked up and had a big group of students and said, hey, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. I just went like that. And it was like, oh, 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 oh. It was the response. And somebody yells out right in the middle. They yell, Happy Singles Awareness Day, right? And I, I was just completely taken aback by it and, and, and just responded without thinking, literally without thinking. I said, whoa, there's a lot of envy in this room. And then the response was, whoa, that was hard. That was hard. And I said, well, is there anything wrong with celebrating people that have somebody who's found somebody and they love them, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Are there poor ways to celebrate it? Yes, but is every person's good relationship 
a statement that you're a loser because you don't have one? I don't think so. So every time God blesses somebody other than you, right, you want to crap on that blessing because it is a blessing and say that somehow that's not fair. And really underneath all that is, God, you're not treating me right. And daggone it, I'm not going to rejoice in theirs until you give me mine. All right, that was harsh. Okay, so, right, the cynicism is sarcasm. And you're going to have people that say, right, oh, that's cynic. This I'm saying, oh, he, you know, he doesn't know anything. That's an idiot, right? Yeah, 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 right. Okay, okay. God doesn't approach it that way. Okay, there's no place for cynicism and sarcasm in the people of God toward the gifts of God, right? So I want to pray against two. Okay, this is, this is probably the, the hardest one. The evil one is going to try to take you if you have been abused. And he wants you to blame God for the evil things someone did to you. Okay, now think about this. As if God was responsible for that person's perversion of his good gift. He wants you to make think that God doesn't care about the injustice done to you. And he wants you to make you think that, that God doesn't love us enough. And he's not powerful enough to reclaim, to use a prophetic phrase, what the locusts have eaten. The evil one wants to step into your life. And I know in a crowd this size, there are people here who have been sexually abused. And deep underneath that, okay, did God cause that? Does God not care? Now, this is not what I'm going to talk about today, but one of the things that startled me the first time I really realized it in the New Testament is Paul talks about sin quite a bit, the Apostle Paul, but on two occasions, and he very seldom ever talks about God being the avenger. Ectike is the Greek term, avenger. Two occasions, both of them, when he speaks about sexual abuse, Ephesians chapter 5, you can go look it up, the first couple five verses, or you can look up uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the first about 14 verses or so. He says God is the avenger. He is the personal avenger of those who are sexually abused. And that in and of itself tells us that sex is not just something merely physical. It affects people deeply, right? So the evil one's going to want you to go into that moment with regret, with anger, in those moments. Also, I want us to pray against an attitude, right, that we all face that uh, it's going to go in one ear and at the other, right? You're going to say, I know what he's going to say before we say it, and I'm not going to reflect on it, right, or I don't want to reflect on it, or it could mess up what I watch on my Twitter feed, right, or the way I engage with entertainment, or the way my girlfriend and I are behaving toward each other, or the way my boyfriends and I, my friends that are boys, let's put it that way, my friends that are boys, the way we talk about girls when we're together, right? So I'm just going to let it go through one end, and it's this guy, you know, he's an old guy anyway, right, and I am, right, I'm, I'm, I'm 61, right, I'm an old guy, so he's an old guy, he doesn't know anything, Right? You, can, you can do that, right? but I, I, if I'm faithful today, I want to give you what God has to say about it. Whether you trust him or not, I want to pray against that. And then lastly, I want to speak to you who want to elevate yourselves with some unwarranted sense of pride because this is not something you struggle with. As if you are not who you are by the grace of God. Right? So I want to talk to you that you think, well, I don't need to hear about this. We're doing fine, right? Maybe I waited to get to have sex before I was married. I didn't do that. I've been faithful within marriage. And so you're thinking of yourself as if you don't have an issue uh, and you're attributing that to your own and you are who you are, to use Paul's paraphrase, by the grace of God. Right? And so all of us, we need to hear this, either one, because we need to be adjusted, all of us, or number two, we need to help one of our brothers and sisters get adjusted or be reminded, right? And I don't care whether you're a grandma or whether you're a mom or a dad or whether you're a high school student or a college student, you need to think through these issues and be able to think wisely for yourself and your relationships with the opposite sex. What you admire and what you don't, right, in terms of that. Okay, let's read a little bit of Proverbs chapter 5, and uh, we want to dig in here to six things that I want to say from uh, Proverbs chapter 5. And again, these are selective. There's so many things that we could read, uh, and we'll read. Uh, unflinchingly, Proverbs chapter 5, right? Let's read it. 
My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion and that your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of, the, of a forbidden woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. <clears throat> but in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to, gr- to the grave, to Sheol, to hell. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander, and she does not know it. And now, O sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless. Lest strangers take their fill of your strength, and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed, and you say, how I hated discipline, and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. Then verse 22 and 23. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. All right. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. All right, now, let's talk about six things, right? So here comes the uh, blanks, right? Here comes the blanks to fill them in, okay? One, sexual intimacy is one of God's good gifts, one of God's good gifts. Sexual intimacy is one of God's good gifts, right? And here, in particular, you want to put verses 15 to 20. That is the key, right? Now, I'm drawing here on one of my colleagues and dear friends and brothers in Christ and somebody that I I just love, uh, a man who has prayed for me and my family every week for 25 years. I don't know many people like that. His name's Dan Estes, and this is from his commentary on the Song of Songs, Song of Solomon. Here's what he says. Estes argues that the Song of Solomon is, in effect, a commentary on Proverbs 5, 15 to 19, right? So in case we missed God's positive vision in Proverbs 5, he says, I'm going to add one more book just to expand on those four verses, The Song of Songs is essentially developing in more detail the positive portrayal of sexual intimacy between a man and a woman in marriage that the father of Proverbs commends to his son. Quote, in the Song of Songs, the key theme is that erotic intimacy within marriage is God's good and sacred gift to be enjoyed, nurtured, and protected. In God's design, sexual delight is a profound part of the richness of the marriage relationship, unquote. At the same time, Dr. Estes goes on to say, quote, although the Song of Songs clearly speaks about sexuality, its overarching theme is intimacy and its development within a loving relationship. Intimacy speaks of the drawing together of two people into a closeness that entails the emotional, the psychological, and the physical. And so as you work your way across the Song of Songs, you get to see the initial flowering of their desire for one another, the consummation of their desire for one another, and the persistence of their pursuit of each other through obstacles in their life. So one, just simple one, it's good gifts. That stands over against every way in which the culture wants to make us think it's dirty every way in which you've experienced it from somebody who has used it as a tool to demean or objectify or use you. That's not God's intention. Good gift. Second, here's the second one. God designed this gift to be shared between a husband and wife within the security 
of a lifelong covenantal union. God designed this gift to be shared between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. Okay? Now look with me at, ch at chapter 5, and let's read verses 16 and 17. There's imagery that's used here in verses 16 and 17. It said, should your springs overflow in the street, your streams of uh, um, uh, water into the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers, right? Here he's speaking about their sexual desire for one another, and uh, this is a favorite phrase of mine that stuck with me. A former pastor's wife passed this on to me, and she says, sex is something that is a private treasure that is shared between a husband and a wife alone. It's a private treasure to be shared between a husband and a wife alone. And here he's just simply saying to his son, should you, should you be sexually engaged with all kinds of people, right? I mean, the world wants to tell you men, right? Wants to tell you men that, that your wife is not sufficient for you. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't even view that in those terms. You need hundreds of sexual attractions through pornography. Right? And it even wants to encourage women to think that it's okay, and matter of fact, it's good and laudable and something about uh, female empowerment for you to present yourself as an object of sexual desire to any man and every man. So that, I, I, okay, and again, this is not, and what people are going to say, well, you're telling that I need to think about how I dress for the sake of the men, the men in my life, and the answer I'm going to say as a follower of Christ, the answer is yes. And as a man, do you need to think about how you dress for the sake of the sisters in your life? And the answer is yes. And why do you do that? Because men are oppressive or women are demanding? No, because you want that person to keep their eyes and heart where it is supposed to be. Now, you can't control any man how he thinks. He can go anywhere he wants with whatever you have on. But you can also dress in a way that makes it easier or harder. That's up to you, right? Right? So I know that in my own marriage, Scripture, the way it puts it here, the only person that I'm supposed to in interact with in a sexually charged way is my wife, period, right? Nobody else, just her. And matter of fact, her too, she's responsible for only responding in a sexual way to one man, and that's me. And so in marriage, if I give my affections or I behave towards some other woman as a husband would behave, then my wife is rightfully jealous because I have taken something that belongs only to her and given it to someone else. So the issue here is he's saying, should you get engaged in that? And what he's going to talk about, the negative aspects of following that kind of thing. But men, this is for us. And if it's true that God has made us this way and empowered us in Christ, okay, let me say this to me and to all of us. He's not asking too much. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? He's not asking too much. Do you believe that? The cultures want to tell you, no, 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 no. He's asking too much, right? You're just going to, you're going to mess up people if you ask them to. We, we even have a movement right now, which I don't have time to talk about, which is trying to undermine from the social sciences area that monogamy is unhealthy for you. Okay? Well, that's what always, that always happens. You know, life precedes its justification. So as people move beyond the bounds of God's thing, then they gotta, they got to circle back and justify their movement, right? And censor the people who say that's maybe not a good idea, right? So the idea here is God designed the gift to be shared between a husband and a wife within the security of a lifelong covenantal unit. I just want to suggest to you, we all know the power of sex, and if you, t if you don't know, right, and you're, you're just a little suspicious about that, you talk to somebody who's been sexually abused. You talk to them. And they'll tell you that you're an idiot if you say that sex is just physical. You don't know what you're talking about. You have no idea, right? And so when you come to the, it's a powerful tool. It's a powerful thing. And so the idea is, notice the biblical wisdom, the only safe place for anybody to be fully naked before another person, sexually, is when you have established a lifelong covenantal union of a commitment for a lifetime that is the only safe place and right place to do that in this fallen world. Outside of that, you are at the mercies of the wild. Right? So we'll talk about that. All right, three, let's come to the third one. God designed this gift to be satisfying for a husband and wife within the security of lifelong covenantal union. Right? So God says, 
right? He's going to say this in the famous verse, right? I remember being a young man reading this passage, right? And getting and, and, and chuckling as I read things, right? Down, oh, I, did, you, did you say that? And I look over at my dad and he'd look at me sternly. Greg, knock it off, right? So and the idea here is, is um, he says, uh, you know, the, the, the one that, that uh, we want to skip over, a loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always, may you ever be intoxicated with her love, verse 19. That it's sufficient for the whole of life, for one man, for one woman. God's interested where it occurs, and he's also interested in how it occurs, right? And I know I've mentioned this to you before, but all sex is, biblically speaking, is the full embodiment of your love for your spouse, right? We all know what it means to embody our love, right? We do it when we walk in here, appropriate brotherly, sisterly love when we walk into the auditorium, right? It's a little, it's a little clunky now because of COVID, right? We have to figure out the appropriate way to express it physically, right? Whether it's an elbow bump, you know, or a fist bump, or a, a still an old handshake, right? Or... When I see Galen, even though I don't know if we're going to die together, whatever, but we just hug each other, right, when it comes in, right, to do that. So, but they're all appropriate, right, they're all appropriate, or there's a difference between when I come up uh, to some of my sisters and moms in the faith, and I just, I just want to hug them and stand next to them. There's nothing sexual and sensual about any of that thing, but you always embody your love. You always embody it. Sometimes the embodiment is just you're standing there looking the person in the face, you're, you're honoring them with your attention and your presence. But you always embody your love. And the, the issue is within, within marriage, it's the full embodiment of your love. And that means that all sex is, sex is governed by everything that love is. And so God's interested that the only safe place to invite somebody to vulnerability is a lifelong commitment. And then even within that commitment, it needs to be governed by love. Because I have met wives and I have met husbands who have been abused by their wives and husbands. And so he's after that. So this is why, and I know I've used this with you before, is that you could take 1 Corinthians 13, and I recommend it to you to think through 1 Corinthians 13 down verses 4 through 8, and it could be read this way. It says, love is patient, but you could say this here. Love, when it's expressed sexually, is patient, and it's kind. Love, when it's expressed sexually, doesn't envy. It's not about conquest. It's not about boasting. It's not about, I've even, I've known people that have slept with other people to injure another person who's hurt them. Love's not a tool to manipulate and hurt people. Love's not arrogant. Love's not rude. It doesn't demand its own way. Wow. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable, right, when somebody doesn't meet your expectations. It's not resentful. It's not the passive-aggressive husband who's walking around the house, right? So all these kind of things here, if you want to think through that, uh, is what he calls us to, right, within our married relationships. All right, number four. Number four, time is coming, right? Sex outside, and this is going to be an unusual two words, sex outside the holy order of things. How's that? Holy order of things is a powerfully destructive force, okay? You want to read that in, in verses 3 through 11, if you want to note that, to work through verses 3 through 11. But what I want to give to you, uh, and I'll make this available if anyone has an interest in it, but I wrote out to myself a paraphrase of Proverbs chapter 5 um, to remind me as a man of my vulnerability and to beg God for his strength and, and sustenance in my life in this area. And I, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, I'm sure I have, but if somebody would ask me, uh, and if many people have, the, the kind of besetting sin or the real struggle that I have, it would be undoubtedly that lust would be right up there at the top of the heap. I don't know if you think a pastor should say that or not, but that's been my struggle. And I've had to lean in on people to help me, to cry out for me, to work with me and that kind of thing. And this is the issue that I wanted to write a thing to myself. I had a guy challenge me at one time, Greg, I want you to, I want you to write out a vision of your life that'll happen if you let your sexual desires get out of control. That's an ugly picture. That's an ugly picture, right? So here, let me just give you an idea 
of how, what I wrote out to myself in terms of the destructive nature of sex out of God's bounds. When I say the holy order of things, this is a term that's fallen on hard times, but the term hierarchy really means holy order of things. And it really means that if you don't pay attention to the way God has ordered certain things, you're going to destroy them and they're going to become destructive forces. Right? And so when you get sex out of the holy order of things, it becomes destructive. Okay? So here's some that I wrote out to myself. Right? And this is really taking off on, on verse 5. Her feet are firmly set on the path of death. Right? And what he's saying is look ahead of her and see that her path leads right down to an open grave. So here's what I, I said. If you follow her, Greg, your reputation will die. God's design for marriages and families will be weakened and distorted as fatherhood takes another, uh, one more step toward obsolescence as an irrelevant, useless, even dangerous component of relationships. You will wound the father's reputation and discourage others from trusting him as another potential father falls. Your dreams and aspirations will die as your world is reduced to your lusts and whatever you need to do to slake them. You will send more abandoned children out into the impersonal court system and social services network and ultimately into a life of unnecessary psychological and material hardship where all the odds are against their flourishing. You will eviscerate trust. You'll emotionally cripple people. You'll crush hope in people. You'll shipwreck people's faith. And you'll call forth mockery as your lack of discretion ripples out through your spheres of influence. Sweeping up your wife, your children, your parents, your parishioners, your students, your friends, your acquaintances, and onlookers so that they just become so much debris that's being swept up by the, your destructive selfish gratification. Love will die as your heart will stop beating for the glory of God, the blessing of others, and the deep yearnings God has placed in your soul for meaning and significance. It will be, it will be replaced by self-loathing, by the consumption of others, and running from God. If that's a bleak picture, I hope that you get it as a very bleak picture. The path of sin leaves right down to grave of everything that matters. I don't want to forget that. I'm not running from that bad picture. I'm running toward Jesus so that that won't be the front picture. Right? But that's the issue here. Okay, then number five. God's people need to instruct one another about the goodness about the goodness, character, and the place of sexual intimacy in marriage. About the goodness, the character, and the place of sexual intimacy in marriage. Right? And let me give you some verses here. These are all the verses where the, the father is crying out. Right? He's stepping into the son's life to say, we've got to talk about something. Right? Put down verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2. Verse 7 and verse 20, right? My son, keep my words, verses 1 and 2, okay? Verse 7, um, um, whoops, got the wrong one. Let me get the right chapter. That might be helpful. My son, pay attention to my wisdom, verse 7. Now then, my sons, listen to me, right? Then verse 20, why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife, right? Let me say mom and dad. Whether you're a single mom, single dad, mom and dad in home, okay? There are great resources to help you step into this awkward place. And dad going, whoops, I just over there. And you got to step in there, right? Don't be someone that, that lets your kids figure it out from their, their fellow peers at school. Right? There's a ton of real stupidity there waiting for them. Right? Just, you can't afford to do that. So it's just awkward. I didn't have somebody do that with me. Well, then, Dad, go on and find somebody that can help you do that. I, I hear this, focusfamily.org, familylife.org, right? I can help you with, a, there's a whole bunch of great resources that you can use. Is it awkward? You better believe it. Are you going to talk about something that maybe you struggle with yourself? Probably. Right? Is, is your kid going to be a kid when you talk to them about it? Certainly. 
Are, are you going to, are you going to get, get embarrassed? Well, yes. Well, but that going to, who's going to tell them about it? And you want them to know the blessing of God. Here is a dad who's saying, son, we got to talk. Well, I'm sure the son was not running up to him and say, dad, teach me about it. Right? He's probably ready to run off with the rest of his, you know, fools and go off in the direction. I, I got this, dad. You don't understand this, all this kind of stuff like that. And, you know, come, please, please listen to me. Right? Maybe you need to get a weekend where you get off and you have some time alone with each other. You can talk and set it up. And I'm telling you, young people, you ought to look to your parents and say, we got to talk about this, right? And parents, you ought to be willing to say, yes, we'll figure it out, right? So I just want to encourage you, this is one of the things we have to do as the body of Christ. Every time you walk outside this door, some of you have looked at stuff while I'm preaching here this morning that's influenced you in terms of sexuality, right? So every time we walk, I mean, it's just pounding us. It's just pounding us day out and day out, Right? And so if, if we don't talk about it, who's going to talk about it? So if you need help, let's, let's work together as the people of God to figure it out. Is it easy? No. Is it necessary? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? So dads, okay, step in. Step in. And I'm, I'm talking, you're a granddad, step in. You're a dad with adult kids, step in. Right? Cool. If I believe that this is a way of life, I want to call my kids to it. And then finally, let me give you the last one. God's people need to instruct and warn one another about the destructiveness of sexual desire when it's expressed outside of the covenantal commitment and without love. We need to warn, right? And we do it, right, as people who, by the grace of God, whatever we have known of the freedom from uh, sexual sin, Whatever we have known of its joys and goodness within our marriages, what is it? We are who we are by the grace of God, right? So the issue here that, that, that uh, the author of Proverbs is talking about, we as the people of God need to address the reality of how God has made us and call one another to live into that truth. So here's the vision I wrote out for myself and uh, uh, about how I wanted to think about sex and how I wanted to pass it on in my own family. Greg, here's what God is calling you to do. To stay faithful to the wife of your youth. Greg, respect God's boundaries on your sexual appetites. Your marriage has more than enough life-giving water to slake your and your wife's sexual desires for life. That's what he says. Greg, the private treasure you share with your wife should not be polluted by the involvement of any other person. You hear that one? The private treasure you share with your wife should not be polluted by any, the involvement of any other person. That includes the images I see, and it includes how I talk about my wife and our private moments with other people. Fourth, third, I pray blessing, this is the, this is the Father's prayer. I pray, bless, I, pray, I pray blessing on your union with your wife. I pray that you both may delight in each other. And I pray for you that you will continually choose to delight, to trust God that true delight will be found in the wife of your youth as your age together. That is to say, I pray that you will always be satisfied in her sexually because you are captivated by the love you have shared over life. And then finally, in light of the depths of love you have come to know or that are waiting out in front of you by faith from a life of faithful loving, why, Greg, would you be captivated by someone willing to destroy all that a relationship with a woman could hold when you enter into it and maintain it according to God's design. That is what he wants us to follow after. That's biblical wisdom, right? And I'm going to trust that what I desperately need as a man is I need to love my wife, right? And I said these things to her, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, Till death do us part, keeping myself to her and her lonely, 
alone as long as we both shall live. Why? If that's God's vision, why would I want to try to think that you could satisfy that in some uh, set of hookups with somebody I really don't know? Or to hazard that? So our final question really for all of us, right, is people who know the struggle of this, people who love each other, people who don't stand as people who don't get it. The real question for us all, right, is the people of God, do we, are we willing to approach sexual intimacy as those who fear God? And I'm praying for us, each of us, what needs to happen to you today? Do you need to say, thank you, God, for your mercies in my life? Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my husband. Do you need to have a conversation as husband and wife? Do you need to have a conversation with your kids? Do you need to repent? Do you need to cry, cry out to a brother to help you get free from something? Right? What, what is it that, that God wants you to do? And do we trust him that he knows the way to life? Okay. Let's pray together. Grayson, will you guys come? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your kindnesses to us today. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, forgive me in any way uh, that I, I represented this, this very difficult topic in a way that made it hard for somebody to hear your heart and mind. Lord, there's so many uh, broken places in the world in which we live. There's so many distorted uh, perspectives and attitudes. Oh, God, please help us as your people. Lord, we hear the siren call. Lord, we're awash in the messages and the images. Oh, God, please, Lord, help us. Lord, I pray for the one who feels trapped. Lord, I pray for freedom. I pray for the hopeless to have hope. I pray for the broken and wounded to know your grace and that you make beauty out of ashes. Lord, I pray for the sarcastic and the angry. Lord, please, would you restore what the locusts have eaten? So we pray, Lord, in the name of Christ, amen.